I'm not going to say any names. I'm going to blend all into one person because this happens a lot. Okay. This person's like very good, was an all American, usually is a guard, like a two guard. And he just thinks that like sex and winning are the only things that matter. <laughs> and I hate that guy on every team. We've never <laughs> gotten along on any team I've ever been on. And there's a, a million of them. All want to be Michael Jordans or whatever. They, yep. they suck to be on teams with. It's not fun. Welcome to the No Dunks podcast series one-on-one. Today's guest is Rod Benson, an author, artist, comedian, and former professional basketball player who played D1 hoops at Cal for a number of D-League teams and overseas in France, Taiwan, and Korea. In fact, he's big in Korea. He probably has that t-shirt. If the name sounds familiar, you might remember too much rod benson the old blog back in the yahoo sports ball don't lie days i loved his writing then i loved working with him and i love his new book different dude where rod tells some candid and hilarious stories from his career so let's check it up i guess winner keeps and let's go one-on-one with rod benson All right, we are here with Rod Benson. Rod, I uh, really appreciate you jumping on. I want to jump right into your book, my guy, because Different Dude starts with you writing, sorry it took so long, I was busy being an athlete. So <laughs> how long has this book idea been percolating and what finally made you write it? Yeah, it's a, it's kind of funny. You're the first person to ask me that, but really it's it, I never had uh, intention to write a book. But so many people when I was playing, especially people who didn't want me to stick around the D-League, would be like, if you write a tell-all book, it's going to expose this and that. So I'm like, I don't want to. But after 20 years of people telling me that I should, I'm like, maybe I should. I don't (laughs) I just have a lot to say. Uh, For sure you do. And this is like... It's such a unique book, and it honestly took me back to the to the blog boy days of uh, us at Yahoo Sports and Ball Don't Lie because, you know, for the most part, these are short chapters, short stories. And what really surprised me, and I want to get your reasoning why, was like, the book is anything but linear, right? I mean, right. that's obvious by choice. Like, your second chapter in the book is about you retiring from basketball for the first time. So, like, what was your thinking behind that? Um, You know, not going, okay, here's me playing youth basketball, and then here's me, you know, eventually going to college, and then then the G slash D League. Like, why this sort of jumping around sort of uh, approach to this book? Yeah, I mean, two real reasons. One, I think the linear story format is kind of boring. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you, it's just... Just another story about someone's career arc. Uh, But also, I don't think basketball, I don't think pro sports really is that linear. It didn't feel that linear. I try to tell my story in terms of like different moments that started different thoughts. So the the opening chapter is about me slapping a guy, but that was like really me, like the day I chose to be a basketball player. And the first retirement story is is like the first time I tried to retire but couldn't. So like (laughs) at the end of the book, you get the real retirement story, right? Mm -hmm. So... These things build on themselves so that, like, by the end, you have this, like, clear emotional picture of what basketball was. A big part of your basketball career is in Korea, where I believe you were for, like, a decade or at least close to it um, and had a lot of success there. What was your favorite part about playing professional ball in Korea and then maybe your least favorite part of of living there (laughs) or playing hoops? Yeah, I mean, just from a basketball perspective, Korea was awesome. It's super technical. Essentially, if you, like... Play, can play technical style basketball. You'll have success there. But, you know, what I, what I liked about Korea the most is, like, if you do good, they'll hook you up. Like, all <laughs> these places have bonuses and stuff like that, but in Korea, it's like, you have one job, and that's get buckets. And if you do it, the world is yours, baby. Like, I was in the, the, the malls buying all sorts of backpacks. I couldn't fit any clothes. So just, like, accessories and glasses. I don't know if you remember my social media back then. Yeah. I looked like a million bucks because they gave me a million dollars worth of things. <laughs> and if I were to say something I didn't like, uh, I mean, it's just real cutthroat. Now, for me, I lasted a long time, but most guys come to Korea for like two weeks and then never get a chance again because they ran into me or some other guy who's been there a long time. And the Koreans are very like results driven. So right. here today, gone tomorrow. And what was your like, what was your schedule like then for like a calendar year? 
of playing pro hoops in Korea? Like, how long is the season? How long were you there? I know in the book you write about, like, at times, like, as soon as that last game's over, as soon as the finals are wrapped, I'm on the plane to go to Coachella or come back. But, like, like sort of talk me through. I'm trying to wrap my head around, like, how long you were there each year. Yeah, it, you know, most uh, overseas seasons start in August. Hmm. Uh, and with the first game of the season being around mid-October. Uh, so there's, like, always, like, a two-month training camp. Uh, and then the season, regular season usually ends early March. Okay. And then a month to a month and a half for the playoffs. So really I'd be there like nine months and I'd be back for three. And those three months we were going hard. <laughs> yes. Yes, you were. And I have followed you on, uh, on social media for a very long time. And I, I even remember some, some boom though summers or whatever you want to call them of what you and your guys would get up to Vegas parties. And like, yeah, you were definitely living it up there for a couple of years. Man, there, there's, there was one summer, I think it was 2012, where like a few of my homies like sat me down like an intervention before I went back to the season. Like, bro, are you gonna be all right this year? Like, I haven't seen you work out. I haven't seen you do this. I'm like, trust me, I, I, I got this. <laughs> and then that was the Coachella year, I think. And I won MVP that year. And then they, they were all like, bro, we're never gonna question you again. Whatever you're doing <laughs> in the off season, I'm just gonna leave you to it. <laughs> do you like? Well, that's interesting. Like. Do you ever, I mean, you never, okay, you got so close to making the NBA. I think that's fair to say. You obviously went to a ton of training camps, summer leagues. I was caught by surprise in the book that you tried out or you were on the Raptors summer league team. And it sounds like you thought that was maybe your best chance to have made a professional NBA roster. Then you had the injury, I believe. But like, you know, you are a different dude. (laughs) Hence the title of the book. Do you ever feel like I just... I didn't go, or how do I put this? Like these people, athletes are sort of psychos. I think you would even agree with that. The elite of the elite, but you have other interests. You have other things that intrigue you. Like, do you ever like, if I had only 100% put everything into basketball, you know, I would have been in the league or I would have done this, or is that silly to even say? Uh, I think that's, I think it's fair to say if I had gone 10% harder, whatever that means, but you know, my first three, four years out, we were going pretty hard. Like I was in Sacramento training with Gus, uh, Eric Armstead, the the lineman from the 49ers, his dad trains everybody in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we would do like two or three a days, get in the weight room. Like I was sleeping in a place with like four other dudes, like just training, like right. we did all that. Uh, but I'd say that I still wasn't the dude who like showed up six hours before a game to shoot like a thousand jump shots. Like, no. <laughs> right. And uh, I know a lot of guys who did that and are not in the league. They're just guys. Yeah. Uh, and further, like a lot of that stuff is for, you know, um, training your, I don't know, the repetition training. Uh, but for me, my strength as a basketball player was that I could like very quickly like patternize and understand things. So realistically, like, I mean, if I had, Worked on dribbling a lot. Maybe I would have been a point guard or something. But other than that, I pretty much maximized the things I could do just from understanding the game better. So I really didn't think I had to work as hard. Right. And then there's this part that keeps coming up in the book that, you know, especially for me, again, working with you at at Yahoo, I couldn't believe it. But it felt like you blogging had some effect, at least on some of these teams, this idea like, I don't know, this guy's writing about crazy things and he might expose us or whatever. Like this idea that you blogging. Now, I think now a days, like no one would even blink. But back then, I guess it was pretty unique for an athlete like yourself to be writing such things for Yahoo. But like, did that did that hurt you, your chances to, to go pro in the NBA? Is that fair? Because it comes up a couple times in the book. Man, it's it's crazy that you don't remember that. I feel like you, it was like there's like a lot of controversy about this. Like in the book, I use Bill's emails to set this up, but you know, ridiculous upside was writing stuff about it all the time. Like other other uh, publications were like, why isn't Rod Benson in the NBA? And they would interview GMs, and they'd be like on the low, like we don't want he he talks too much. And at the time, I was just writing about like steak and shake and stuff like that. Like uh, you know, Larry Bird asked me to stop writing entirely when I got to the Pacers. And, you know, in setting it up, he was like, we had the mouse in the palace, Jamal Tinsley shot himself. We can't have any other distractions. Mm -hmm. And and, and, equating me writing about steak and shake to shooting (laughs) myself. And, And looking back and knowing all these different systems the way I do now, it's just, 
I, I, I mean what I'm about to say. When people are doing kind of weird, shady things, they don't want a truth teller near them. Like, right. And, and I was young enough to not know that I was just like so like honest that it made people upset. And I was just like, what? I don't get why this is wrong. I think that's why I guess I was naive too. Like you, when you asked that to start, like you didn't really remember this. It's like, I didn't think it was real. I just think there's no way what you were writing under the too much Rod Benson for ball don't lie would have like any impact on your actual basketball skills and what you could bring to a team. It's like, but it did. And I guess like they just don't, they want to remove any possibility of any issues at all. And I guess you writing something that they could assume or, or say, Oh yeah, he's telling too much or he's, he's, yeah. he's wild. I don't know. I think if I was in the league now or in and around the D league now, I'd be doing something else that would trigger them the same. Hmm. Because the thing is, it's just a matter of, you know, once they did the social media awards and they could control it or, or like, you know, earn money from it. Yeah. First, of course, it was a, you know, but that was three, four years after I left. Uh, but when you're in that, when you're in that, you know, back in the days, uh, I'm thinking of my boy, Richard Mingley. He played at Cal and then he's a scout for Atlanta. And now I think I want to say he's with the Brooklyn Nets as a scout. But the first day he got hired, he called me and he's like, OK, now that I see what we do, like you'll never get signed. <laughs> like now that I actually see, he's like, there's no way, there's no way it's ever going to happen for you, bro. And I was like, damn, it's like that. He's like, oh no, it's like that. Like you're, you're ex nay. It's not happening for you. Because you're not what, like a robot? Uh, yeah. And okay. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but you know, like any business, like any power structure, there's still like men in the room. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people didn't like me as a player because I was a thinker instead of like a talker more, you know. And so, you know, there's a lot of guys who think I'm bad at basketball. Like, he just got lucky. It's like, no, I think about things differently than you. That upset people. Right. That upsets people. I upset coaches. I, like, again, if you just know, like, if you're just smart and good at your job, you're going to upset somebody at your job. Mm -hmm. And in basketball, it's no different. And the people at the top want to stay at the top. So keep it, keep everything <laughs> suppressed a little bit. Sure. You brought up Bill. That is your agent. Uh, do I have that yeah. correct? Yeah. And you you include in the book, uh, you know, like emails that Bill has sent to either, yeah, I guess ridiculous upside or other teams or like, you know, trying to big you up. Like, look at all the rebounding numbers and all this. I, I love that addition. Um, was it trippy to go back and like sort of revisit these emails and reread these emails. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't plan on including the emails or any of the art stuff. I just really uh, just started writing the book and then thought that would be fun to like add an email. Then I was like, cause I'm going through these, like trying to find all this old material to, material to jog my memory. And I'm like, bro, Bill used to write some wild emails. Like, <laughs> like is he, did he really, I, I mean, I, I kind of, depending on how you hear the book, like if you hear it, you won't get this, but if you read the physical copy, you can see where I redacted all the names. Yeah. He sent some of these emails to like 200 NBA personnel. Yeah. And it's like, Rod Benson is a better rebounder per minute than Dwight Howard. You guys got to get on board. And I'm like, this is a wild thing. Like when I got it at the time, I was like, am I that good? I don't think I'm that good. You're overselling me, Bill. Yeah, I love that. It's all redacted at Pacers, redacted at Spurs, redacted at whatever team. Oh, it's so funny. Well, Bill's in your corner. He's trying to make a point here. But, uh, oh, that's so good. Do you have a favorite um, story from the book? I mean, how many are there in total? Like, there's at least, like, 100 sort of little yeah, stories? Yeah, there's, like, yeah. 120 okay. stories in the book. Do you have a favorite? Uh, or at least a favorite to, that you to, that you wrote? Uh, I'll tell you the one that I think is missing from the edition that you have. Oh, okay. Uh, which I think, like, you know, because uh, I added this story later because I think it really contextualizes a lot of what the, the youth side of being this is. But uh, the story goes... We, you know, I was like 12 or 13 and my mom just said, we're going to LA. We were in San Diego. She put us in the car and we went up to LA. We went to like the city of industry, technically, like a place with a bunch of office parks. And my grandmother was there. Now my grandmother was famously very unkind. Like she didn't let me keep toys at her house or anything like that. Okay. And so like, she like ran out and gave me a hug and she was like, oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. You're so handsome. And I was like, what's happening? Like, I'm like six foot one now. And she hasn't seen me in a couple of years. So she's like hyped that I'm all tall. Okay. So then the, she walks me into the office park. And I guess I meet all her coworkers who all take pictures with me, like stretch my arms out, like stand back to back. And are like, wow, you're really going to really gonna be something. 
And then she took me outside alone and she was like, when you get rich and famous, don't forget about it. Don't forget about us. Whoa. And I, and I say, uh, in the book, I say like, I'd never forget about you. I lied. And then she looked up at me and the sun was in her eyes and she goes, don't worry, you know, white girl like Kobe. See? Holy moly, this is your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I haven't, no, that definitely is not in the, in the version I have of this book. In, in, the, in the version that's on sale, that's the third story and it's called White Girl Like Kobe. <laughs> okay. You know what's, okay, this is interesting because I did hear you on the True Hoop podcast talking uh, to the guys there. And you said you got in this conversation about how writing this book, it felt like it changed your perspective a little bit on the relationship with your mother and then your father, who was absent a, a big part of your life, and how it like has sort of flipped. I don't know if you want to speak to that or it can speak to that, but that was really, you know, sort of jarring and like definitely interesting or fascinating. Yeah, it's 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 wild because you know, I started this project and I wanted to do stories, so I have like 10, 15 stories in my head that make sense. But that's not enough. So I'm like, great. I got to like, I played basketball for 15, 20 years. I got to remember more than 12 stories, you <laughs> idiot. Like, so I started like teaching myself how to remember the past better, uh, different like mnemonic devices. And when you do that, and you just remember like so much of your life more clearly, you you can kind of see t moments where like you could have gone left or right, and like why you went left and why you went right. And it's just really interesting that all of that led me to like kind of just uncover that my family been lying to me <laughs> my whole life about my dad being a deadbeat, which is wild because I kind of play him in the book. But, you know, the book is like just the perspective I had at the time. Yeah. But th that perspective was given to me. It was it wasn't earned. And when I earned my perspective, it was like, oh, damn, there's a lot of there's a lot of fugaziness. Not just I mean, again, it's like it's not just my family. It's like a lot of the structures we have. Like if you just get told one lie at one time, you just go on believing it forever. Sure. And <laughs> in my life, that's how that played out. My family wasn't really about me, uh, but I'm not alone in that. And it made me who I am now, so I'm not going to sit here and complain about it forever. Yeah, but so like they sort of pushed your father out of the picture and then told you what they wanted to tell you, that type of thing. But you've reconnected, like, or at least connected, it sounds like, with, with your dad sort of since writing this a, a little bit more? Yeah, in the last... Two months I've spoken to my dad three times and on the phone. And before that, we'd spoken zero times in like twenty years. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, like, look, this is like a lot is I you and I could not look more different. You know, Rod's a six ten black guy. I'm a five ten white guy. Uh, I'm a Canadian, he's American. Uh, but there are so many things in this book, man, that I like I don't know, I connect into it. That that hearing that on the True Who podcast, you know, I have that I have a very weird relationship with my father as well. The uh just the the time of you living in this book, you know, sort of pre cell phones and stuff like that. I was like, oh yeah, I you know, remember that. Uh, <laughs> so there was a lot of things that were clicking for me, and of course all the, all your love for basketball and, and mine as well. Um but that's uh that's fascinating to hear, the the sort of switch. Or like you said, like you just believe something and you're like, Okay. I mean, it's my mother and my grandmother and my family telling me this. It must be true. And then as you get right. older think, and learn think about it, like every time you watch an NBA game and they and and it, the officiating goes super crazy, you're like, God, is Tim Donahue like, what's the truth here? Like, <laughs> and the thing is, like, you're probably right. Like, I, the NBA is kind of cooked right now. And I think people can feel like, what's the lie? Who's lying to me? Right. Who's like, how come I don't know the scores anymore? I just know, like, that LeBron's kid is like like doing poorly at USC. Like we don't know anything. It's just what they give us. Yeah. So like again, like I think my problem when I played was that I was giving people something that the NBA wasn't like giving themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that could they can't if you can't control a narrative, you can't control a person's like future and outcome. Yeah. Do you follow the NBA closely? Did you ever don't care for it? Where are you with like? your love or dislike for the NBA? Uh, I used to watch it a lot more. In the last three, four years, it's just kind of gone off the rails to me a little bit. Uh, I was talking to my buddy about this the other day, but, um, you know, LeBron scored 40,000 points. Like, 10 years ago, I thought I'd be having, like, a like a full cocktail party for the <laughs> for the affair. Like, you guys, he's done it. He's, <laughs> the greatest has arrived. <laughs> I, 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 you know, Luka Doncic scored 73, and I didn't even watch the highlights. Didn't right. really care. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think when you keep devaluing the you know, scoring um, specifically, it just makes it kind of hard to watch. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand. 
Uh, I personally, and I'm, you know, I've said this on other platforms, we got to start the petition three in the corner. They already got the lines basically drawn out. And as soon as that line bends straight, you can't stand there more than three seconds. And see if that, that I think that would make the game oh, so much more interesting. Interesting. Three in the corner that way, like a, like a defensive three second rule or offensive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't just stay there. You can't park there. You got to move out. You can't park. The only reason we have three in the key now is because they couldn't stop like Lou Alcindor and, <laughs> yeah. and Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, yeah. uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Okay. Well, if you let him stand there, he's just going to score a lot. Yeah, if you let someone stand in the corner all game and shoot threes, they're going to score a lot too. So if you want the game to move again and feel different, I say chart, tax someone for standing there. Okay. Give them three seconds. Interesting. It, uh, in your games in Korea or a lot of your overseas games, did you play 40-minute games? 40-minute games. Yeah, yeah. Are you, I'm, see, I'm a huge fan of that. I watch at least when the Olympics come around and World Cup stuff. I love all that. You know, And Team Canada is now suddenly good. Um, I'm a huge fan of the 40-minute game as well. I don't know if you have an opinion on it. I think that the... F- I mean, I didn't like it so much before, but the FIBA format is producing better basketball and better basketball players. Mm. 40 minutes, the rules, the like, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that refs overseas are better. I think it's just a hard job. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the basis of things like the things you know can't happen there don't don't happen. Like you will get a travel call right away if you do something weird with your feet. Even if you think it's like, what, what did I do? Travel. doesn't matter. <laughs> we don't do that here. Like, and that keeps the, like, that's why all their best players are coming here and Becoming our best players. Right. We don't make the best basketball players anymore. I'm sorry to tell everybody. No. They're all coming out of a place with an E at the end of the name. Serbia, <laughs> Croatia, <laughs> Lithuania. They, they're making the best ones. Yeah. No, that's true. And the way – yeah, you're right. This The style of play, of course, and the, the movement and passing and stuff like that. A lot of the best players can do all that. Um, to go back to when you were young, I'm just fascinated by this. Because I remember growing up with kids that were just super tall for their age. And it felt like – some of these kids were basically pressured into playing basketball. It's just a, hey, you're tall, you should play hoops. Was that the case with you when you were, you know, sprouting up and suddenly you were six feet tall when you were 12? Like, were people just like, yeah, you got to play basketball? I know you played volleyball as well, but were they like, yeah, you got to pick up a ball? Uh, there was a little of that, but I wasn't the tallest. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, if I was just like about town, sure, maybe, uh, but like kind of where I grew up, the socioeconomics of it all, like, no. In fact, I kind of, I don't, I think this is in the version you have, but the, there's a story called SAT GPA where I talk about, you know, the fact that this AAU coach basically found me when I was 16 and was like, I'm sorry, you snowboard? What are you doing? Right. Yeah. You got to get you to a basketball court. Because before then, it was just, I was just kind of floating around. My high school is number one in San Diego. They didn't really need me. Huh. Uh, I was more like, just like pressure to be an athlete in general thing is the only black kid around all these white people they're just like well he's fast somebody get him a get him a ball give him something right did you do you ever regret not maybe not regret but like you were a good volleyball player like you were recruited pretty heavily do you first i guess do you still play at all or beach volleyball or anything like that or and and do you ever have like wow i wonder if i went sort of that route i know it's not like Uh, you're not making huge huge money maybe in the volleyball scene but if you have a passion for it yeah, I, I don't think I ever really had a passion for it. Oh, I think okay. I just liked it. It was the first sport that I was good at. I really wanted a Letterman jacket like every 15-year-old. <laughs> and I was like, which sports are going to get me this damn jacket so I can go out with Amber because I think she's amazing <laughs> or whatever. And like, none of that happened. <laughs> uh, but you end up just playing these sports because you're like, I don't know, you're just trying to prove you're like a man kind of. Mm. But I definitely don't play volleyball anymore. Uh, I tried to do like a rec league a few years ago and I was like, it was the best one they had in Santa Monica, okay. like one of the best places for volleyball. And I was so much better once I kicked into gear that it was like unfair and weird. Oh. So then it's like, what am I doing? And I just <laughs> really haven't tried since. <laughs> and do you still do that with basketball? Like, do you ever show up to the to the Y and, and you know, hoop and, and kick the snot as people? No. Or sorry, have you given that up? There's like literally no point in me doing that. I guess like to stay in shape, but there's yeah. really two outcomes. I win and people are like, well, yeah, if I was your height, I would be doing the – or I lose and they're like, wow, you? <laughs> like, I, there's a, the, the dude from TMZ, Van, Van Jones, Latham. Van Lathan. Yeah, Van, yeah, yeah, Van Lathan, yeah. He used to play at the LA Fitness a lot. Uh, and so I'd be there, like this is uh, in Hollywood. Uh, this is like 2015. This is like while well, I was still actually actively playing. Okay. But I wouldn't go hard at all. So because I just wasn't trying to get hurt, et cetera. Uh, 
And then one day someone like pissed me off. So I just started going like super hard and I scored every point. Like literally they, the other team couldn't do anything. This is how good, like when we really turn it on, like they couldn't pass anywhere. I just stole every pass, <laughs> blocked every shot, right. dunked, was like, and we ended up winning. And then afterwards, Van Lathan comes up to me. He's like, man, like, so you really do this, huh? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like yeah, yes, my guy. Like, I'm sorry. I, I can't show it here. Right. There's no point. <laughs> well, yeah, I could see why. Because some people think, again, athletes at your level, you're, you're so good because you can never turn it off. That's what some people think, right? So no matter what run you're at, be it NBA, G League, overseas, or a YMCA run, you will just be always locked in, you know, crazy MJ style. But you're saying, why would I do that? And you're just sort of getting a run in, whatever, just sort of staying in shape a little bit. Uh, but when you wanted to turn it on, you would dominate the average, the amateur player. I would say, actually, that's, that's a really good way to describe all that because i think that is what separates athletes from i mean nothing's 100 yeah. percent. but more athletes are like can get there quick but it, starting there that's how you end up with like crazy the crazy people who like abuse and like get into trouble and stuff because they never turn it off that's mm -hmm. very rare hmm. if you can turn it on at a moment's notice that's like there's some like I, this is super random but uh, something i've thought about a lot any athlete listening to this is probably gonna laugh but if you've ever played like a real game like a like a professional basketball game and you have to go to the bathroom at halftime. It's so weird. Your body's so up, like so up. And then you're just like in a dead stop and like silence in a toilet. <laughs> and it's like, it's like so unnatural and weird. Sure. It's weird. You can feel your body like, wow, I am not normal right now. Like <laughs> I might have to handle this after the gig. There's some guys who literally have to like take a number two right before a game. Cause their body just gets so riled up that right. it like, it just shoots out of Oh, we, we have this theory with Anthony Edwards uh, earlier this week. He missed tip-off. I don't know if you saw this. Like, he wasn't there for tip-off. They got to delay a game. I think Nikhil Alexander-Walker had to start for him. They said he was stretching in the back and doing resistant bands. TK, Trey is like, no, he was taking a dump for sure. He was <laughs> he was on the toilet a little too long. Yeah, that that happens. Yeah. I mean, it just how you, you hear the national anthem, you're like, oh, I got to get back out there. <laughs> like, too late. You missed it, bro. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of you being good at basketball, one of my favorite chapters was, uh, it, I, I believe it starts with you saying, quote, I used to consider myself the best basketball player in Vancouver, Canada. <laughs> Laughed out loud at that. Uh, you had a you had a relationship uh, with a girl up there. She was from there, I guess, right? So you were up there a decent amount. And you talk yeah. about like going uh, and hooping at like St. Kitts and in some of the gyms. And, uh, you know, maybe you were at the time or you were at the, you were at the very least were on the short list of one of the best players at that time in Vancouver. Um, I think so I was funny. like my competition at that time was like Robert Sacre. <laughs> oh, yes. uh, yeah. and, and I think that was it. Like a bunch of like street guys. Like there wasn't, you know, I'm sure there was some guys in some college somewhere, but I was, you know, I was a pro. Right. We're talking like 2016. Like I was, I was legit. Like I would go to Canada and be like, this is what you have. <laughs> this, is, this is the best you have to offer. Wow. It's a whole different culture. <laughs> Play for Team USA. What's yeah, up? yeah, exactly. You're wearing the <laughs> this right. This isn't shirt. real. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully they were nice to you at least while you were kicking their ass. Were they saying sorry? They, they were. Yeah. And that kind of sucks. Yeah. The, the Canadians being nice while playing sports is so frustrating. <laughs> like, oh, hey, do do it to me again, hey? Like, what? What do you mean, do it? Like, oh, it's a mean dunk. Like, you get punch me or something. Like, ah, do yeah. anything other. Like, we don't need to go for smoothies after this. It's right. cold out. What are we doing? Right now, we're wired differently up there. Uh, it's going to be competitive, uh, hopefully. But yeah, we're going to be kind about it. Uh, one thing that's that shocked me is like a little later on, you were sort of like you know getting to the end of your playing career. I guess wanted a bit of a paycheck. You signed up for this three on three tournament. And you go yeah. to Saudi Arabia, I guess, to play in this thing. But you were even admitted, like, you thought you were just going to show up and sort of dominate. Again, you are a professional yeah. basketball player. And that is the opposite thing that happened. And, like, it's a different game and, and probably just, a, obviously, you were playing, like, super late at night. But that was it sort of must have been shocking that you're like, oh, wait, hold on. I'm not kicking Man, ass. Everything about Saudi Arabia was wild. From, like, landing in an airport on a fully empty plane to, like, 200 people in like full like burkas where you couldn't see nothing but their eyes yep. like overstaffed like because it's kind of like a military bunker it, i don't know it's super weird but the basketball man a lot the dude's doing three on three. this sign started pick like putting together that the best basketball players are now like all croatian lithuanian serbian because 
they are dominating that space. Hmm. And these aren't like, I thought that, man, there's going to be some short guys and they, they were a little smaller than NBA size, but I saw like six different teams from those areas who have like all six, seven, six, eight guys who can do everything. Right. Can do everything. <laughs> and it's just me out here getting like one point little post-ups and you know, it's two, it's a two and one there. Like, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the scoring is super unfair anyway. So, I mean, I'm like drenched in sweat at 3 a.m. losing in Saudi Arabia to all these Lithuanians that are cussing me out. I can't grip the ball. My hands are so sweaty. And I'm just like, God, just give this up, bro. Like, what are you still doing here, Rod? You're old. That, oh, that, that was a bit of a like, uh, oh, what am I? I should maybe uh, think of uh, retiring. Well, that I think that chapter ends with me saying that's the second time I retired. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, right. You'd have retired a couple times. Yeah. That's, did, was it the type of three on three where – if the team scores, like, then you just take the ball and you continue to play. Have you ever done – okay, that is – I did that for the first time not long ago. I didn't grow up playing three-on-three three that way. I, You know, you check it up. We take a little break for a second. That constant three-on-three, three, that's that's insane. It's truly, like, the most physically taxing version of basketball I've ever played. Yeah, okay. And that's why the two-for-one matters even more, because yep. if you can get an open three spotting up, you use way less energy than you do backing someone down. Right. And then you only have four guys in your team, and you can only sub, like, during a dead ball, and everyone's exhausted. So, like, the good teams are so used to, like, hey, just one guy, you know, it's your turn. It's your turn. <sighs> we were, like, put together where we, we tried to do that, and one guy's like, I need another 30 seconds. <laughs> like, like yeah, I need to come in. Like, what are we doing? Like, we were all so dead. Right at the start of these games. <laughs> Holy moly. Uh, okay, here's a fun one. You, again, you went to mini camps, you were at summer leagues, you trained with NBA teams. Do you Did you in the time have a favorite NBA player in being around uh, that was maybe kind to you or you just were like, oh, you know, I thought that person was cool. It turns out they are. So, uh, who was your favorite NBA player? And then obviously I want to know if there was a dickhead or two that you just couldn't stand. Man, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll get to the dickheads, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I first, my the first NBA experience I had for real was training camp with the uh, with the Nets. Okay, and uh, I don't know I guess because I was really looking for guidance, like Vince Carter was actually really really dope dude. Uh, uh, in terms of just being like kind and like talking to me and like you know they had a ping pong table in the locker room, so I like ran like this ping pong tournament because <laughs> uh, uh, I was like blogging about it or something. I don't know. This is before Yahoo, <laughs> and he like he like won the tournament and it was like not, like like just even participating with me like i'd be like oh what's the best like city to meet women and he's like toronto my guy i'm like toronto <laughs> not la miami like no maybe all everybody knows toronto everybody knows toronto right uh facts <laughs> uh if i had to say a, a shitty guy there there's so many it's unreal <laughs> but because really? they, they're kind of like they're i'm gonna blend i'm not gonna say any names i'm gonna blend all into one person because this happens a lot okay this person's like very good, was an All-American, usually is a guard, like a two guard. And he just thinks that like sex and winning are the only things that matter. <laughs> and I hate that guy on every team. We've never <laughs> gotten along on any team I've ever been on. And there's a, a million of them. All want to be Michael Jordans or whatever. They, yep. they suck to be on teams with. It's not fun. They're just two, they're just two one track mind when it comes to those two things. That's it. Well, and they also don't like – there's only one Michael Jordan. There's a million people trying to be him and not winning. So you're yeah. on a team with a guy like that and you're like an eighth. It's like, bro, stop. Right, right, right. That's got to be infuriating <laughs> for sure. And you feel like there's almost one of those or two of those or three of those on every team. There's at least. so like, many. Yeah. There's so many. I would actually say like a lot of those guys like even go on to be like the TV personalities. Like they just want to be seen forever. Right, right. Like show me I'm important. Like right. You're not. I don't like you. I'm right. sorry. Loudest voice in the room type thing. Uh, yeah. But yeah, doesn't yeah, mean yeah. you're the most important or most interesting, I guess. Uh, that's cool to hear about Vince Carter, though, because like, and I think you uh, you touched on it at one point in the book, like when you're going to these camps and stuff like that, like Vince Carter's seen, uh, 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 you know, a million Rod Bensons come through to try and make the team. They're there for a week, maybe two, and then see you yeah. later. So you don't need to, you can understand why they maybe don't go out of their way to make a connection with every person that comes through the door. Right. Is that fair? Yeah, and I would say, like, again, like, Jason Kidd was there, uh, uh, Richard, Richard Jefferson, Jefferson was there, yeah. uh, a few other guys, and I'm not saying they were bad guys, they just, like, behaved how I expected them to behave, like, oh, yeah. okay, great, like, I hope you make it, like, <laughs> and Vince was like, no, I'll take the time to explain to you why my navigator has a 
satellite dish on top. Like, sure. <laughs> That's pretty nice of you, Vince. Thank you. Uh, well, bringing up Kid, one of my favorite stories in the book is, I think you were like nine or 10 years old. Your mom asked if you wanted to basically change your name and go by your grandfather's last name, which was Kid, spelled exactly yeah. the same way as Jason Kid. You know, you sort of thought about it and you're like, nah, Rod Benson, good name. Which I agree with. That is a good name. I think it's better than Rod Kid. Uh, too many D's uh, to call yourself. It's very funny. Um, but then your mom, especially with you going to Cal, started telling like coaches and people there, like, "Oh yeah, Rod's Rod's related to Jason Kidd. and everyone sort of yeah. is like, "Okay, I guess we'll believe her and go with that." And then you got a chance to meet Jason Kidd, and sort of had to almost were forced to bring it up, and then. He definitely had no clue, and I don't even know if it's true that you're even ever related to <laughs> Jason Kidd. That was uh, so funny to me. I'm pretty sure he just said, like, he was like, oh, the dude in Oakland? And I was like, no, not in Oakland, in Louisiana. Like, oh. Oh. All right, then. Like, that was like, that's like pretty much the only conversation I ever had with Jason Kidd. I was on a team with him for a month. Uh, but yeah, it was, it, it, you know, a lot of these stories, I try to get across a lot of points, like, subtly, but. One thing that really sucked about that and that I tried to highlight is how different college and NBA media were. Like in college, they did put it in the media guide, but they didn't really talk about it. Right. NBA, like the first second I was in there, this guy is making me talk to Jason Kidd about it and we haven't even met. I said, bro, can we like, if 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 what I'm saying is true, you're introducing family members, why are you the one to introduce family members, weirdo? What makes you so important? That's heralddaily.org. Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> but, and so do we know officially whether or not you're related to him or is that? I am not at all related to Jason. Okay. Kidd. Okay. I didn't think so. The, the grandfather that was in question. Yeah, he is. It just turns out that I am not related to that grandfather. Uh, the story had a lot of caveats. A lot of caveats. Okay. That's great. Uh, another fun chapter, really short one in the book uh, that jumped out to me was your friend saw love and basketball in theaters, and when you asked him how it was, he replied, too much love, not enough basketball. I don't know why that made me laugh out loud. Uh, but we were like 14 also, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, of course, you want more basketball, <laughs> less love. What is the best basketball movie of all time, according to Rod Benson? If you had to pick, or a yeah. short list. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's still White Man Can't Jump, hands okay. down. Uh, as an LA, as an Angelino, yeah. and as a, as someone who likes just both the actors and like, I think there's an accuracy to like their desperation. Uh, but if I had to say a dark horse number two, okay, it's a uh, hustle with Adam Sandler. Oh. I wrote an article about it. Like you actually get a sense of what, how good, some of these guys are. Like you're watching Hernan Gomez, who pretty much nobody knew him. Like his older brother, I think people knew, but not him before this movie do drills like dribbling a tennis ball with one hand and like running up and it's like bro yeah you can't do that none of you can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i can't even really do that this guy <laughs> does can barely make a roster yeah you can like to actually see like no you're not nearly as close as you think bro it's not just a if i had your height thing you gotta be able to do all that stuff and that guy did it in the movie i thought it was gold <laughs> yeah it's a great movie that's a good call uh and fairly recent too you're right uh before we start wrapping this up man this is awesome um like you, you, you played ball, you played professional basketball and, and yeah, a good chunk of the book is about that, but there are chapters on your clothing company boom though. And you know, a little bit later, this idea of like being a writer and being an artist, I know you do improv. I mean, you really do it all. Um, what right now is your favorite of the bunch or is Rod Benson have to have his, you know, his hand in a little bit of everything when it comes to especially arts, man, I think I'm just someone who just happened to. I'm like if Forrest Gump was smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it just, it, it, I just keep ending up places and then I just do the thing, think, like in, in earnest thinking like, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. And then years later, people are like, bro, no one does that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, I really didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, you know, I really do do a lot of different things and they all give me a lot of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll say that improv comedy is probably the most frequent thing that gives you that hit because you're on stage. Sure. Making stuff up. Uh, you know, our team is also like a really like I'm 6'10". My team is like average height, like 6'5". For, for comedians on stage, it's wild. It's like watching the Monstars do comedy. <laughs> and I, I love it. I love, I love that we just come on stage like, here we are. Right. <laughs> Time to make you laugh. 
<laughs> so you do that frequently, but you, I mean, you do, you do both street art. You obviously do, I think commissioned art for people. Um, yeah. and then, and then the writing, are you still writing for SF gate? Is that still a, uh, a yeah, I kind of, kind of quiet quit. I don't know if okay. anyone remembers watching, but it, it's like, it, it, I, I, I'll speak to that a little bit. It's just hard. Like not being able to write the stories that I think that people need to hear. Uh, and for really two reasons. One is that people don't read like interesting stuff. They read like the most read stuff on SF gate is like which coffee shop opened and like, oops, a puppy. <laughs> and like, and it's like, Oh man, these nine things are controlling your parking pricing and you need to know about it. And mm -hmm. it's like, ah, we're not going to do that. It's like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. Cause you went in on uh, for a while there, at least when I was following you on Instagram, the, I guess sort of, I don't know what you call it, like rental crisis or scam or whatever going on in California, yeah, like probably the, around the world. The, yeah. In LA, in California, this is like not the channel for this, but every person in my, that I could vote for up and down is a Democrat and they're all pretty much corrupt. And I hate to say it, but like Nancy Pelosi trades it three times Warren Buffett. What are we talking about? Mm. Like, <laughs> but we can't talk about these things. So like, we kind of just like, don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like eventually we're gonna have to start talking about like the truth of what life is. I will say, I'm glad you asked that question because that's, that's a big part point in the book for me. I'm like, I think there's, we're entering the age of authenticity. I could feel this like a year ago. And I'm like, someone's gonna have to just saying what life actually is. Like, why do we pull punches so much? Like all that's led us to is to like hide ourselves and be like miserable and allow pe like abusers and weirdos and like corrupt people to run everything we do. Right. Just be authentically yourself and I think everything will be fine. Well, there's no doubt you are, Rod, man. This book is awesome. Again, uh, encourage people to go check it out. So what's the easiest way, Rod, for people to get their hands on on Different Dude? I believe it's differentdude.com. Do I have that right? Yeah, you can get it at differentdude.com. Uh, you can also get it anywhere that sells books online. Okay. Uh, and you can also listen to it for free on Spotify. If you just uh, We're all broke out here. If you just want to like, hey, I want to save my money, I get paid the same if you listen to it on Spotify. So just listen on Spotify. Oh, okay, there you go. Didn't even know that was an option. Uh, and where else can people follow you? Uh, I don't think you're on the X slash Twitter anymore, but I see you're in the threads game. What's the best way to follow Rod and, and all your work? Yeah, you can find me on pretty much every platform at Z-S-O-R-R-Y-O-N. That's Jerion. It's my middle name. It's also my art name. Uh, and that's how, that's TikTok, uh, Threads, and uh, Instagram. Okay, there it is. Uh, Rob, this was awesome, man. I've known you for so long. I was, th I don't, have we ever met in person? We met at the Once? 2008 All-Star Game. Yes, okay. For like two minutes. This is the longest conversation we've ever had, really, outside oh, of like time. email. Like, I like I like that blog, Rod. Like, yeah. Again, I, we didn't really say that, set this up very well, but like, or maybe you did beforehand. But like, you 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 were like my editor, right? So yeah, you were just you were. I was you were in there over my like, head, man. I didn't know what the hell <laughs> editing. I you I think you say at one point you're like I would just send this in and let them post it, and I didn't care. And like, you would just send it in. I would make sure there's no spelling mistakes, and I would just post it. I wasn't asking for rewrites. <laughs> The Wild West, baby. But the, it's nice to like actually have a real. It's like catching up with someone in front of like a bunch of random people I don't know. Right. <laughs> yes, it's are. true. There are people watching and listening to that, and uh, and we appreciate it. Hit the like button, subscribe, and uh, yeah, leave us a five star rating and review. Uh, but this was really cool, and uh, yeah, I'm happy you said there was that one time because that's what I thought too. I was like, I feel like there was an All Star Weekend, but that was like that was my first ever All Star Weekend. Um, with Yahoo, of course. I remember I had flight problems trying to get there, so it was a bit of a mess. But uh, it was a short, short meeting. But I'm glad we got a chance to do this. I feel like I've known you so well because, you know, I do follow all your work, your writing, your online stuff. Um, so I'm happy for you, man. Man, I, if I, you know, that All Star Weekend, if I could tell one more quick story. Yeah, do it. It was really funny because you're right. There was a lot of flight issues going in and out of New Orleans, but especially because the D League, we're all such small market teams that like getting our flights to New Orleans, especially this was all announced last minute, like a lot of headaches for a lot of people. But right. essentially after the game, we played a game the next day back in like Sioux Falls. And Kasib Powell was Sioux Falls best player. And Carlos Powell was, you know, one of ours alongside me. And we were all talking after the, after the all-star game, like we're going to have to take like six connecting flights to get back to, to North Dakota. <laughs> we're going to get back like with 30 minutes to go before the game at best and then have to play. Like, how about we just don't? And so we all kind of made this pact to like, just kind of miss our flight and like chill one more night and go back the next day. And then like, 
And then like an hour later, Kasib texted from the airport, like couldn't do it. And then we're all like, ah, oh, the play is ruined. No. So like he, he's, cause he's on the other team. Yeah. So like him sitting out was like part of the thing. Like if we all sit out, it'll be fine. Sure. Now he's going back to go get his 30 piece. So now we had to go back and it was like, it made everything worse. Cause I was running like super late. Cause I was trying to take it easy. It was a whole mess. And I, <laughs> I didn't end up play the game anyways. I got there in time, but I just sat there cause I was like, just fully red eyed, like cracked out. Oh, you didn't even play in the end. Still didn't play. Just oh. sat there in my in my street clothes on the bench like a like a loser. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> that guy screwed you though. Yeah, you guys had a deal. We're gonna party in New Orleans for a night. What's the big deal? We missed one deal league game. Oh man. I don't know if we really had a deal. It might have been one of those like whoops. Yeah. <laughs> See yeah. you in He's Sioux like, Falls, yeah, bro. <laughs> we'll take we'll take the W when you guys aren't there. Uh Rod, thanks again, man. Everybody go to differentdude.com uh, or check this out on Spotify if you want to hear uh, is it your voice, Rod, reading the book? <laughs> It's my voice. There it is. There it is. Uh, is. Go check it out. Uh, Everyone, thanks for joining us. We will see you when we see you next. Brace the day, people.